This is the eighth video in this series on interpreting chest x-rays, and the topic is focal lung disease. Today's learning objectives are to be able to identify, localize, and describe focal opacities, particularly pneumonia, and to know the varied appearances of pulmonary nodules and cavitations and their differential diagnosis. I'll start by discussing lobar anatomy and radiographic zones in the chest in order for us to accurately describe the location of a focal lesion. Some of this was originally covered in the second video on normal chest x-ray anatomy, but to very quickly review, the horizontal fissure of the right lung is typically the only fissure that may be visible on the PA view, being roughly horizontal at the level of the hilum. It's generally not visible on the lateral view. The oblique fissures are located here, but because they run at oblique angles to the x-ray beams in both the PA and lateral views, they are usually not visible in either. The right upper lobe is located here, and the right middle lobe, most notably making a wedge shape as seen from the side, and the right lower lobe, which not only comprises the most inferior portion of the lung, but most of the posterior surface as well, frequently extending up as high as the aortic arch. And then the left upper lobe, which anatomically would probably be better described as the left anterior lobe, and the left lower lobe, which would be better described as the left posterior lobe. While it's very helpful to identify the location of focal lesions by the specific lobe in which they appear to be located, Clinicians frequently interpret AP films without the benefit of a lateral. As you may imagine, it is often not possible to identify the exact lobe when only given one view. Therefore, when only given the front to back view, whether it's AP or PA, one can describe location based on lung zones. There are four. Anything at the level of the clavicle or above is in the apical zone. The upper zone extends from the clavicle down to the superior aspect of the hilum. The mid zone includes anything at the level of the hilum. And the last, the lower zone is anything below the hilum. Be aware that these lung zones do not correlate with the lung zones numbered 1, 2, and 3 that are discussed within the context of pulmonary physiology, mechanical ventilation, and PA catheter placement. These zones are a completely different concept. So let me now talk about some focal opacities. The first thing to discuss is the distinction between the confusing terms opacity, infiltrate, and consolidation. There are no formal definitions for these terms, and they are often used interchangeably and in nonspecific ways. In the most common usage, at least in the US, the term consolidation is reserved for a relatively large, dense, homogeneous opacification frequently involving an entire lobe. Some radiologists recommend against using the term infiltrate altogether as it strongly biases other clinicians to assume the etiology is an infection. If the term infiltrate is used, it is helpful to qualitatively describe it as alveolar, interstitial, nodular, or cavitary. When identifying and localizing an opacity, there are two helpful radiographic signs. The first is called the silhouette sign, in which there is a loss of the normally visible border of an intrathoracic structure caused by an adjacent pulmonary density. For example, a density in the right upper lobe can obscure the border of the ascending aorta. A right middle lobe opacity can obscure the right heart border. The right lower lobe obscures the right diaphragm. The left upper lobe can obscure either the aortic knob and or the left heart border, which is specifically bordered by the portion of the left upper lobe called the lingula. And a left lower lobe opacity can obscure the left diaphragm and or the descending aorta. Take a look at this example. Which normal border is obscured by a density, and therefore where is that density located? In this case, it's the left heart border that's obscured, 
and therefore the opacity is located in the lingula. Another helpful radiographic sign is often called the spine sign. This refers to the presence of an abnormal increase in opacification overlying the spine while moving superior to inferior on the lateral view, suggestive of lower lobe opacities. For example, consider these two lateral films. On the normal film on the left, as one moves superior to inferior along the spine, there is a progressive increase in lucency such that the vertebral body just above the diaphragm is the darkest. In the film on the right, there is an increase in opacification as one reaches the inferior most two vertebral bodies just above the diaphragm, suggestive of a lower lobe opacity. It is not possible to tell from the lateral film alone whether this opacity is in the right lower or left lower lobe. What are some of the etiologies of focal opacities? Obviously, there are infections, that is pneumonia, which can be bacterial, viral, fungal, or mycobacterial. There are malignancies, which can be primary lung cancer, metastatic disease, or lymphoma. And other etiologies uh, include pulmonary infarction, pulmonary hemorrhage, vasculitis, and eosinophilic pneumonia. Let me focus on infectious pneumonia for a few minutes, as this is by far the most common etiology of focal opacities. There are several distinctive radiographic patterns of pneumonia. For example, the best well-known and easiest to identify is lobar pneumonia. This is characterized by homogeneous consolidation, air bronchograms, and sharp borders which correspond to fissures. The classic causative organism of this subtype is Streptococcus pneumoniae, also known as pneumococcus. Contrasting with lobar pneumonia is segmental pneumonia, more frequently referred to as bronchopneumonia. Bronchopneumonia consists of patchy opacification and vague borders. It is frequently bilateral, and air bronchograms are relatively uncommon. Classic causative organisms include Staph aureus and Pseudomonas. Klebsiella and H. flu are commonly associated with both types. Then there is interstitial pneumonia, in which the opacification has a reticular pattern lacking air bronchograms. Interstitial pneumonia often develops into airspace disease, mimicking the appearance of bronchopneumonia. Typical organisms to cause interstitial pneumonia are mycoplasma, viruses, and pneumocystis. Round pneumonia has an interesting spherical shape, which is easily mistaken for a tumor or other lung mass. It is much more common in children than adults and is caused by H. flu and streptococcus. Finally, cavitary pneumonia, which we'll come back to later in the video, may or may not have air fluid levels and is classically seen in TB and Staph aureus. So let's apply some of this information to understand and interpret some x-rays of pneumonia. What do you see here? There is obviously opacification in the right mid and lower lung zones. There appears to be a silhouette sign in such that the right heart border is obscured, suggesting the opacification is located in the right middle lobe. We can also easily see the sharp demarcation between the opacity and normal lung tissue. This border corresponds to the horizontal and right oblique fissures. There is an air bronchogram right here. And notice that the right costophrenic sulcus is clear, suggesting that the right lower lobe is not affected by the pathologic process. So how would you summarize this chest x-ray? This is a right middle lobe lobar pneumonia, most likely a result of streptococcus pneumoniae, but also possibly Klebsiella or Haemophilus influenzae. How about this x-ray? There's a silhouette sign in which the left diaphragm is obscured. On the lateral film, there is a pacification of the lower thoracic vertebrae, also known as the spine sign. And therefore, this is a left lower lobe lobar pneumonia. In this example, we see opacification in both lower lung zones. The opacifications are not as sharply defined as in the last two films, and there are no obvious air bronchograms. This is bronchopneumonia. 
Here are two examples of the unusual round pneumonia. It's easy to appreciate why they can be mistaken for a lung mass. They can't be distinguished radiographically from these, but rather on the clinical history and the fact that the round pneumonia will resolve over days to weeks. Let's move on to discuss pulmonary nodules. The entity of a solitary pulmonary nodule is defined as a well-circumscribed, generally round density, smaller than 3 cm in diameter. If it's larger than 3 cm, it's referred to as a lung mass, though the differential diagnosis and general approach is largely the same. Although nodules are one of the most important findings which radiologists look for when evaluating an x-ray, the majority of them may be missed on initial review. A comparison to prior x-rays is critical when evaluating for them. The differential diagnosis for a solitary nodule is very long. It includes various forms of cancer, the most common of which is primary lung adenocarcinoma. Most cases of metastatic cancer present as multiple pulmonary nodules. Infectious and inflammatory causes include granulomas, which are typically very small, well demarcated, and calcified. They are consequences of prior infections, such as histoplasmosis, coccidioidomycosis, and tuberculosis. Granulomas are generally believed to be responsible for the majority of benign nodules, which I've never personally understood since the infections which are classically described as leading to them are themselves relatively uncommon in this country. As we just saw with round pneumonia, these can present with an identical appearance. And there are some congenital etiologies, such as an arterial venous malformation and a bronchogenic cyst. An important aspect of successfully identifying a pulmonary nodule is using the correct amount of contrast. Consider these two films. They are identical, with the exception of increased contrast in the film on the right side. I think most people will concur that the nodule is slightly easier to see when the contrast is turned up a bit. And consider this example. Where is the nodule here? Although it's approximately the same size and round shape as the film on the right, its central location near the hilum makes it much more difficult to spot. When patients present with multiple pulmonary nodules, the differential diagnosis changes quite a bit. One should still worry about cancer. However, there are now a number of other infectious etiologies to consider. These include fungal pneumonia, mycobacterial pneumonia, nocardia, septic emboli, parasites, specifically echinococcus, paragonomyosis, and schistosomiasis, rheumatoid arthritis, and vasculitis. Finally, one miscellaneous cause of multiple pulmonary nodules is amyloidosis. Here are just a couple of examples of patients presenting with multiple pulmonary nodules. Here is metastatic disease. This, in this case, this is from uh, endometrial cancer. And invasive aspergillus. And here are some rarer causes, amyloidosis on the left and echinococcus on the right. In the right film, that specific morphology of the nodules in which they are unusually large, very circular, and have overlapping appearances are sometimes called cannonball nodules. Most pulmonary emboli result in no apparent changes on chest x-ray. Rarely, a large PE can result in one of several eponymous findings. First is the unfortunately named Hampton's hump. This is a wedge or dome-shaped pleural-based opacity due to lung infarction. This opacity may take months to resolve and frequently leaves scarring in that region. Sometimes Hampton's hump can be a little bit more subtle. Then there is Westermark sign, which is focal oligemia, which is a fancy way of saying focal reduction in the appearance of lung markings. This is due to both lack of blood flow distal to an embolus, as well as redistribution of blood to other adjacent areas. Can you spot the Westermark sign in this film? Lastly is Fleischner's sign, 
which is a prominent central pulmonary artery caused by distension of the vessel as a consequence of a large PE. In this case, we can see both Fleischner's sign as well as Westermark's sign more peripheral to it. The final topic in this video is cavitation. There are many etiologies of a cavitating lung lesion. Pneumonia, most commonly staph, pseudomonas, or Klebsiella. In this case, the patient has a necrotizing right lower lobe pneumonia due to aspiration. Lung abscess, which is sort of a special and extreme case of cavitary pneumonia. Tuberculosis, one of the most common causes of lung cavitation worldwide. Pulmonary metastases, of which squamous cell carcinoma is the most common to do this. Here is an x-ray of an IV drug abuser with HIV who had septic pulmonary emboli, presumably from right-sided endocarditis. About 5% of pulmonary infarcts cavitate. Here's an 86-year-old woman who actually presented with failure to thrive and amazingly had no acute pulmonary symptoms. A CT angiogram here showed a large central PE. Granulomatosis with polyangiitis, formerly known as Wegener's granulomatosis. Cavitary masses in this condition can be either thin or thick-walled, can be very variable in size, and somewhat uniquely, they can wax and wane over time. Rheumatoid nodules in the lungs can cavitate. And finally, a pneumatocele should be considered particularly when the nodule or mass is thin-walled and occurs in the aftermath of an acute pneumonia. Patients at this stage can be surprisingly asymptomatic and pneumatoceles usually resolve over time provided that appropriate antibiotic treatment for the pneumonia was provided. One cavitary-like process makes sense to also mention here, and that is an aspergilloma. Aspergillomas typically arise within pre-existing lung cavities that become colonized with aspergillus. Like pneumatoceles, these can be surprisingly asymptomatic, but may also be associated with a chronic cough. These are also known as fungus balls. So that concludes this video. The next one will cover both atelectasis as well as lines, tubes, devices, and prior surgeries.